Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be of a one and a half of a duration. There will be a short break of five minutes, 40 minutes after the commencement of the lecture. May I now have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, Dr. Mohan Piris, former Chief Justice and President Counsel. Mr. Mohan Piris was appointed as the 44th Chief Justice of Sri Lanka on the 15th January 2013. He was the Attorney General of Sri Lanka from 2008 to 2011. He was called to the bar in 1975 and joined the Attorney General's Department in 1981 as a State Counsel, later serving as a Senior State Counsel for over 15 years. During this time, he trained at the National Institute of Trial Advocacy at Harvard Law School the Centre for Police and Criminal Justice Studies at Jesus College, Cambridge, and at George Washington University. Leaving the Attorney General's Department, he started his private practice in the unofficial bar. He specialised in original and appellate courts in the areas of inter alia administrative law, commercial law, land law, fundamental rights, industrial law, injunctions, and criminal law, and as an arbitrator. He was the chairman of the Board of Examiners for the Intermediate Examination and Examiner of the Sri Lanka Law College, a visiting lecturer at the Faculty of Law of the University of Colombo, Deputy President of the Sri Lankan Bar Association, and a member of the Sri Lankan Delegation to the Universal Periodic Review at the eighth session of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Mr. Mohan Piris now serves as the permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in New York in the United States of America. Sir, we're deeply honored to have you present here with us and we warmly welcome you to conduct this lecture on Asian Legal Framework Lessons from Sri Lankan Experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome. Uh, and uh, it's uh, nice to be once again uh, to be with you at the Kotalawa the Defense Academy. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see each other uh, as much as we would have done had we been physically present. But uh, this virtual environment, uh, this marvel of science that uh, permits us to speak to each other in a virtual environment, uh, uh, makes it as real as it could be uh, in the circumstances and the environment uh, that we are presently faced in. My dear students, <clears throat> I'm asked to speak, with, speak to you this afternoon uh, on the Asian legal framework and the lessons from the Sri Lankan experience in the course of this short uh, study uh, on the, uh, the linkages between these legal systems that are prevalent in Asia. <clears throat> now, to speak on a topic such as the common aspects of legal culture and uh, legal ethos in Asia is, uh, you will appreciate, is a difficult task. When it concerns countries from the several regions of Asia. Let me try and make it as easy as I could. And I intend to present to you the legal systems of a few sub-regions of Asia due to the constraints naturally of time. And would encourage you to engage in a deeper study of the subject on the basis of the foundation that I will seek to lay in the course of this presentation. My dear students, in legal terms, we have to distinguish between the traditional laws of these countries in Asia and laws introduced during the last few centuries. Why? Because as a result of their colonization or of a politically conscious decision of Asian governments, or governments in this area to modernize and reform their legal systems. 
Now, you will appreciate that in this process, you will encounter a number of laws. For example, you will encounter Buddhist law, Hindu law, Chinese law, Islamic law, and perhaps, if I was to use the description, a cocktail of local customary systems of perhaps great complexity. The Asian region, therefore, has experienced a global influence with the introduction of laws from all over the world, from Britain, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, and finally the United States. Now, that being the case, it is a complex task really for me this afternoon to perhaps, and even for you, to focus on the common features of these many different systems that we will be looking at this afternoon. However, just as in different parts of the world, <clears throat> notwithstanding the fact that we will look at the whole world, so to speak, and particularly focus on Asia, these, there are common features that did exist, although they are different legal systems. You will soon see that they all share values invariably based on religion, with somewhat similar historical influences and experiences, and perhaps a similar adaptation to the process of what modernization. You will also appreciate that neither are any of the religious values strangely endemic to Asia. Although we believe that all the great religious values started here, you will soon see that they were not actually peculiar to Asia. My dear students, Islamic principles can be found everywhere where religion plays a dominant role, as in Africa and in parts of Europe. Christianity, still often associated with the West, are equally strong, if you look around, in Asian countries such as Korea, such as the Philippines. Now, with economic globalization, accompanied by an increase in foreign migration, all major religions tend to exist side or tend to exist side by side in modern cities, although, albeit, with varying degrees of influence in the different parts of the world. So, but while many of the fundamental dogmatic principles that differentiate cultures from one another, you will appreciate, are on the decline. They are disappearing. The, <clears throat> the breadth and the depth of the historical experience and exposure to one another of countries uh, in different regions of the world has helped them to retain some of their distinctive features, at least for the time being. Now, if we look at uh, a country like Japan, Japan's connection you will see with China dates back to hundreds of years before the arrival of the Europeans. And if you look at Indonesia, Indonesia had received at first Hindu Buddhism and later Islam from India before the Portuguese and the Dutch established shipping lanes and trading ports in the archipelago. Many Hindu Buddhist elements have survived as part of the culture of the Indonesian main island of Java, even as we speak today. Again, the staying power of such cultural influences is not specific to Asian cultural influences, as can be seen in the Philippines, 
where the Spanish legacy has remained strong for more than 100 years after the Spaniards were replaced by the US as a colonial power. My dear students, you might ask yourself the question as to what defines a region. What, what is that defines a region? Now, our study question will, as the academics, academics suggest, that a region is the peculiar mix of religious and cultural values with new ones following from modernization and the level of historical and cross-cultural interaction. So you will see from my presentation soon that many of the jurisdiction, jurisdictions share many of these features, although only a few would share all of them. However, the picture that presents itself remains necessarily blurred at the periphery, at the outer parameters. You will agree with me <coughs> that the division, think about it carefully, you will agree with me that the division of our part of the world into East, into Southeast, into South Asia, is perhaps uh, an invention of colonial policy and was obviously made through European lenses, was looked at through European lenses. So it is my view that cultures cannot be put into compartments and classified so easily. Let's look at some examples. Let's take Vietnam. Vietnam, for example, was part of, part of China for hundreds of years and has culturally more in common with Confucian East Asian countries than with Southeast Asian neighbors. Although it shares the experience of European colonialism with the latter group of countries. But similar statements could easily be made for Europe. Europe was no exception, which is also a melting pot of different cultures that share a long common history and now increasingly virtually an economic policy. <clears throat> My dear students, you will appreciate that the modernization of the region's legal systems really began in the 19th century. In East, in East Asia, Japan perhaps was one of the pioneers. Now, after the restoration of the imperial rule in Japan in 1968, under Emperor, Emperor Meiji, M-E-I-J-I, -I, the Japanese government commissioned studies of various foreign legal systems as potential models for Japanese legislation. They looked at a different models. They looked at the British model, the French model, the German laws were studied, with German influence becoming particularly strong at the turn of the, turn of the century in civil and commercial law. As they went on with colonization, American models were added with the occupation after World War II, especially in constitutional and business law areas in the Japanese jurisdiction. If you let's look at the Chinese, the Chinese reacted to the threat of foreign domination much later, much, much later. And not a Qing dynasty, the imperial dynasty of China, succeeded by the 1912 Republic of China. The Qing dynasty was systematic. Uh, where a systematic efforts were undertaken to introduce Western influence laws, right? That was the last of the dynasties, as I said, succeeded by the 1912 Republic of China. The Japanese, coming, going back to Japan again, the Japanese experiences were carefully studied in China. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, after the Qing's overthrow, the overthrow of the 
the Emperor Qing. The new nationalist government introduced new civil and criminal codes in China. Influencers again came from Germany, but in particular from the new Swiss code, praised for its conceptual clarity and structure. It also became a model for other young modernizing nation states, surprisingly such as Turkey and perhaps Nepal. Now, in other parts of Asia, adopting Western law was no deliberate decision. It came to them through, sorry to say, colonialism. The French Revolution, or revolution provides a turning point in time in this regard because it signaled the end of the first period <coughs> of European colonialism, where territorial control was of little interest, and during which the British, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spaniards were content with controlling a few trading ports and sea lanes. They were mariners. It is a matter, therefore, of historical record that the ideas of the modern nation state <clears throat> of territorial control and of territorial control, you know what a modern a nation state is, where cultural and territorial borders actually merge, that in the modern nation state and of territorial control arrived in the Dutch East Indies with the administrator by the name of Dendels, D-A-E-N-D-E-L-S a Dutch politician who was the 36th governor general of the Dutch East Indies between the year 1808 to 1811. Now, Dane Dels, an admirer of, he was a great admirer of Napoleon. Now, that was a time with spices and other exotic goods, increasingly supplied by other regions. And with the onset of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, the economic interests of the colonizers shifted to plantation farming of rubber, tobacco, and sugarcane. Control over the colony, colonial territory was consequently extended to the interior. Now, this increased involvement in the colony required at least some form of a legal structure. <coughs> and that's where our whole focus begins. The Spaniards, if you read history, were pretty late comers to industrialization. And they made some attempts to modernizing a colonial economy only towards the end of their rule in the Philippines. The Portuguese continued to rule their colonial possessions, their spreading ports, and showed no interest in developing the hinterland, the, in the inland areas they controlled. Now, the legal system of East Timor, if you look at it, remained little developed. And customary law was the rule of the capital city of East Timor called Delhi. The British transferred the common law to their colonies, but allowed for application of customary and religious laws via the concept of the personal laws, which applied in particular to family law and in particular to inheritance succession, in other words. Now, in general terms, the legal system in the British colonies were less problematic. They gave little problems. Because why? Because the common law as a kind of a customary order was far less hostile to the use of local rules. They were, they were very comfortable with local rules. And the inherent pragmatism, the practicality of the system, allowed mostly for finding common sense solutions. In other words, they saw in our legal systems a very simple common sense approach to problems, which is actually true. On the other hand, the Dutch and the French had to develop classifications and rules for conflicting approaches between European 
and local customary laws. Now that was a very clear distinction between the English approach and the Dutch, Dutch approach. The Dutch were famous for classification, codification. As was previously mentioned by me, the European, the Dutch developed perhaps the, if I, I won't be wrong to say, the most complicated system of with the what of a body of laws. In all colonial jurisdictions, a separate body of rules developed for trading minorities of the Arabs, of the Chinese, and of the Indians. So there you are. Colonization, not by Europeans, but by the Japanese. By Japanese was the reason for introducing Western law, as I said, in Korea and in Taiwan. Now, the specific context of introducing European laws in the colonies in Asia meant that the law was not the same as in its colonial motherlands. But as students, you will see that while private and criminal laws were often highly developed, constitutional and administrative developments were far behind. They lagged far, far behind. And procedural laws did not provide the same kind of guarantees against transgressions by the state that Europeans had become accustomed to. There was little or no redress for actions against the state, right? That's how the colonials behaved. For example, let me give you an example. For example, the Dutch applied different procedural codes in the East Indies. Sophisticated codes transferred from the Netherlands applied only to Europeans. Would that surprise you? The, the, the high codes, the sophisticated laws only apply to Europeans, right? While they applied uh, all kinds of laws, procedural laws to us as and when they pleased. So for the indigenous population, a very basic simplified code was used which gave a, the judge paternalistic role in settling disputes, in deciding what evidence to gather and in what way to gather that difference. It was, it was his law, he was the judge, he was judge, hangman and juror. There was little natural justice. So in the view of the colonial government at that time, simple transactions of the indigenous population, the local population, did not require sophisticated rules. Interesting, isn't it? Ironically, the Japanese military government abolished the sophisticated codes during the occupation of Indonesia in World War II in an attempt to rid it, to get rid of European influences. And you will see that even today, Indonesia, applies the insufficient procedural code, right, to its indigenous population, a simple procedural code to their local population. Now, my dear friends and my dear students, another legacy of the colonial period in many countries is a tendency to rule by decree. That governor's decree, this governor's decree, this governor general's decree, this king's decree and so on and so forth. It was an order he decreed. So with constitutional administrative checks and balances, right, little developed. There were no constitutional checks and balances. They were all good friends. They were all the Europeans. They did what they willed. So they never actually, they patted each other on their backs. And it was a question of you scratch mine and I scratch yours. And so with constitutional administrative checks and balances very weakly developed, the colonial administration was in a position to make many ad hoc decisions, ad hoc meaning decisions as they please, on the spot decisions on issues that would, would elsewhere require the approval of the state or perhaps today of national parliaments. There was also a tendency for legal administration to be strongly centralized upon a governor general. You have heard, I won't, you know, the number of governors general 
we had in this country. As a, what was the result? As a result, Western legal administration in the various provinces developed very slowly. And this in turn helped to reinforce customary law. That's how our customary laws developed because Western legal administrations in the provinces was slow to develop. Now I have said enough with regard to the background. Let's look at very briefly the Asian legal system in the 20th century. What was the approach? My dear students, interestingly, the European colonies in Asia gained independence after World War II. That's common knowledge. They embarked on a vigorous process of nation building, social modernization, and perhaps of economic development. <clears throat> we are doing it even today. And again, interestingly, the colonial legal framework was usually, they maintained it. Many of the new states were made up of provinces that before colonization had not been under the same national umbrella. There were a number of provinces that probably were not in the part of the colonization. Right? In some of our countries, like perhaps like Sri Lanka, like Ceylon, it was when the British planted the flag over the whole of Sri Lanka that we became this unitary country. Occasionally, they had not so not much more in common than their desire to end colonial rule. So they got together with the desire to end colonial rule. So there were widely varying views, my dear students, between different fractions of the independence movements, even on achieving this goal and the various means to achieve it. The Indians did it differently, the Pakistanis did it, did it differently, the Nepalis did it differently, right? Uh, the, uh, the Bhutanis did it differently, the Indonesians did it differently, right? For example, some regions were looking for some form of autonomy as part of a commonwealth of states, right? Some of them formed into a commonwealth of states, as you probably know, as they were less concerned about do the dominating influence of the colonial power, right? Right? Now we see, for example, in the Russian Federation, the Russian Commonwealth of States. Parts of the elite and certain population groups had held privileged positions in the colony and were anxious about being replaced by different elites in the new national context. Mind you, the colonials, the, the colonial administration had influential locals. They were friendly with them and they were given positions of power and this new alignment of power in the new in the new colonialistic environment made the elite feel a little uncomfortable and that happened in Sri Lanka too. Because they lost their privileged positions in the colony and they were anxious about being replaced by a different elitist group in the new national context. Look carefully at our own situations and you will see it playing out even today in our own situation. So these ethnic and social differences became particularly accentuated, where also it was supported by religious differences, right? So the ethnic differences were even given greater uh, propensity where there were religious differences. Now, Southeast Asia uh, has been troubled, as we all know, by ethnic and religious conflict since the end of the World War II. Burma, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines immediately comes to one's mind, and perhaps India and Sri Lanka, as countries plagued by regional unrest and upheaval. Probably that was much in Sri Lanka. Countries, certainly Burma, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, were plagued by regional unrest and regional upheaval. However, interestingly, Thailand and Vietnam have ethnic and religious minorities too. In Cambodia, a long simmering border conflict with Vietnam has repeatedly erupted into violent persecution 
of ethnic Vietnamese. I ask you the question, is it not surprising then that the young nation states preferred a continuation of the colonial legal order until a legal system with more indigenous features were created? Think about it. Is it surprising that the young nation states that were put together by virtue of uh, uh, their territory, a common territory and a common culture, preferred the continuation of a colonial legal order until the mess, the local mess was put right. <clears throat> I have heard that saying even here. Oh, I wish the British were here. Thank God they are not here. But that, that kind of thinking occasionally is heard, even in our own thing. That we are messing up things in such style that it was British, they say, well, it, it was good if these colonial masters. That's a wrong bit of thinking, but that is said. They sometimes think about it. So there you are. The latter would have required a basis in the various customary and religious laws. So in other words, the legal system with more indigenous features, right, would have required a basis in the various, would require a base, its roots, in the various customary and religious laws, right? However, not only is there systematic study uh, every time, uh, which is very timely, that of course is a study perhaps that you might have to undertake and very time consuming. But the differences between the various systems are sometimes perhaps almost impossible to bridge. To bridge the gap between our indigenous, indigenous systems and perhaps the colonial systems are sometimes not easy. So such laws in the Asian region, therefore, were maintained largely as identity symbols and to keep the national system's flexibility in dealing with regional issues and conflicts at a grassroot level. <clears throat> now today, for example, we talk of the English principles of constitutional law. We talk of the separation of powers. We talk of the judicial, of judicial independence. We talk of uh, the, the, the sovereignty of parliament, the sovereignty of the people. Now, these are very, they are symbolically fine. We talk of a constitution. And that is symbolically done, right, to, to, to perhaps address the region of the issues within our own country and conflicts at a grassroots level, isn't it? But have you asked yourself the question, yes, we have a constitution, but we, do we have constitutionalism? I'm afraid the question is not so easy to answer. So there you are. For these reasons, the situation of legal pluralism, that is the coexistence of various legal orders, will persist for the time being in this area. We would have to live and let live with these colonial laws, right? Because we need legal pluralism and we need the coexistence of this legal order to keep it together until we think better. Remember that the present legal system with all its faults binds us together, keeps us together, and let's keep it like that until we find something better. Of course, my dear students, regional governments continue there are modernization efforts with laws modeled on, look at modeled on what? On Western legislation. If you think of modernization, we can't think of anything in-house. We can't think of anything, not anything indigenous. We can't think of, in other words, the decolonization of laws. Have you ever thought of the decolonization of laws? No. If we, have, if we think of modernization, we have to look at England. We have to look at the United States. We have to look at, yes, we must look beyond passport control. But have we seriously looked at what we have lost? Just imagine, just imagine talking the principles of sophisticated English law to a farmer in Angunukala Palasa, 
or in Bakamuna for that matter? Think about it. Can you talk of sophisticated Roman Dutch principles to a, a villager in Dativu or perhaps in Akraipattu or perhaps in Panditarapu in Jaffna? No. So there you are. Think about this. That's what Asia is riddled with. We are, we are perhaps so enamored with, uh, with Western civilization that modernization is synonymous with nothing but looking at the West. I have no difficulty about looking at the West. But let's try and develop that Western model to, to suit our indigenous conditions. My dear students, walk into one of our magistrates court in a village and see the treatment of those poor people who come to one of our courts, right, who have to face the brunt of a very westernized legal system. For example, I have heard the Murli of courts shout at litigants, uh, where are your buttons? Little realizing that he has only one button to that one shirt that he probably has. And probably he had been traveling in a bus for three hours to get to court for a hearing, which he, if he is lucky, uh, would be perhaps two, three minutes. Think about these things. Now, these are little thoughts that I want to leave you with in the, in the context of the Asian legal system that I referred to a few minutes ago. Let me briefly look at India, the big neighbor that stands towering over us the great India, 1.35 billion people, 1.39 million square kilometers, 29 states, 11 union territories or whatever it was with a central government with a quasi federal structure. In contrast to us here, which is 25,000 square miles, 22 million people and a unitary structure of government. Right, with a limited devolution of power in terms of the 13th Amendment. Let's look at India. India's history can be divided into the Hindu period spanning almost 3000 years, roughly from 1500 BC to the founding of the Mughal Empire in 1526. The Mughal period uh, that lasted until the final perhaps collapse of the Mughal Empire in 1862. The early British period lasting until 1857 when British interests in India were, as you know, represented by the British East India Company, which actually also ruled Sri Lanka once upon a time. Now, Hindu law, you will see, comprised the Dharma Sutras, the Dharma Sastras, which were commentaries and digests, and the period of direct rule of British India until independence in 1947. The 15th of August, 1947, a few months before our own independence of the 4th of February, 48. Now, you will see that since the coming of Islam, and especially during the centuries of the Mughal reign, Islamic law was added to this pluralist system in India. Since 1694, the British were granted what is known as the Hastings Judicial Plan. It's called the Hastings Judicial Plan, H-A-S-T-I-N-G-S. -S. Hastings was the then Governor General of Bengal who introduced reforms. Now, Bengal is in the eastern the northeastern side, the eastern side of the, the north, it's in the north, northeastern uh, side of India, more towards the eastern side, right? And it was Hastings, who was governor of Bengal, who introduced reforms. And remember, it was in Bengal that the British had their first capital, and that was Calcutta. Now, Hastings, the judicial plan, introduced the concept for the first time of personal laws the application of the right to administer justice in Bengal territories under their control. So in others, it was Governor Hastings who introduced the concept of personal laws, right? 
for the application of the right to administer in the course of the right to administer justice in the Bengali territories under British control. In 1772, the Dutch East Indies required the help of religious officials. Why? Because they didn't know a thing of what the local religious laws were. As experts in deciding on Hindu or Muslim laws to Indians, right? With regard to what family inheritance, with regard to family law, inheritance and religious matters because they didn't know what laws to apply. So they looked for religious officials as that's how the Maulavis, uh, the priests, uh, the Hindu priests became important, right? In deciding uh, family issues, inheritance issues and religious laws. Therefore, pundits, in other words, pundits are people who are learned in Hindu law and the Maulavis, the Muslim, Muslim priests, came to advise on cases of Muslim and Hindu law in India. And again, the Dutch in the East Indies and the British commissioned digests and compilations of Hindu law and in, and in cases involving principles from Hindu law or Islamic law. That was the primitive nature of the law that prevailed then. And that's how the law in India began, began to develop. Quite obviously, the British involvement as judges of indigenous disputes and as editors of indigenous law compilations considerably changed the picture. The British involvement completely changed the landscape of these laws and the character of these laws and the character of indig the indigenous, the local side of the legal system. What happened? Legal text regarded as certain, what was the thinking? Legal text that was regarded as certain, certainty, were applied over customs and traditional laws. So what the British did was a great thing. They stepped in and wrote in rational laws. They wrote legal text because when you write text, you know that. When you write something out, you bring in certainty at the risk of inflexibility. When you write, for example, our written constitutions, it brought certainty, but certainly we lost the flexibility that the British have because the British don't have a written constitution. So there you are. People, people began to prefer certain legal certainty in legal text, legal text that gave you certainty over custom and traditional laws, which actually gave uncertainty. Now you will see that this was perhaps the genesis of the rule of law. In other words, this was the beginning of the, perhaps the end of arbitrariness Uncertainty leads to an arbitrariness, at least arbitrariness leads to uncertainty. And uncertainty too leads to a breakdown of the rule of law. Isn't it so? There you are. So we say laws must be certain, laws must be clear, and laws must be predictable. How can laws be clear, certain, and predictable if it was based on uncertain custom? and uncertain traditional law. Think about it, my dear students. So there you are. So the 19th century saw increased emphasis on a more unified legal system for India. The new approach was most appropriately expressed. It was called, expressed in uh, Lord Macaulay, who was again a law lord, in, right? in his statement to seek, uh, he said, uniformity where you can have it, right? Lord Macaulay said, the new approach, he described it as saying, court, I'm opening the court, uniformity where you can have it, diversity where you must have it, but in all cases, certainty. 
beautiful phrase. Uniformity, where you can have it. Diversity, where you must have it. But in all cases, certainty. So in other words, even to date, what is striking about India is that it's is that it's unity in diversity that makes certain their laws. It is the unity in that diversity that keeps that great India together, my dear students. And that is something that we too must emulate. If we can achieve that uniformity within our own diversity, right, I can assure you, we will not only attain peace and unity, but surely certainty in our methods of governance. So the policy was pursued in India in several law reform commissions, which we have no time to talk to today, especially after India came under direct British rule in the middle of the 19th century. The unification policy produced a number of statutes and legislative drafts unusual for a common law, except if inconsistent with the constitution, molded thereby into a rigid structure, usually that was alien to it. There you are. You might note that India commenced drafting its first written constitution in 1947. Consequent to the mature and relentless enthusiasm of the members of the Constituent Assembly who carefully considered the Constitution drafts. This is very important what I'm going to say. For six days short of three years. Six days short of three years. So if anyone thinks that drafting a Constitution is a walk in the park, I think he's, he or she should disabuse himself or herself of that idea. India took six days short of three years. India obtained independence on the 15th of August 1947 and promulgated its present constitution in 1951, which established a traditional Westminster style bicameral parliament consisting of the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, similar to the lines of the House of Lords and the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. Today, India works within a quasi federal structure with a central government, union ter territories and 30 states inclusive of Jammu and Kashmir, which is the latest annexation. The constitution has seen 103 amendments up to date and has nourished its democratic process in a substantial manner. The Indian legal system was structured traditionally on the models of the English, English legal system in both civil and criminal law, and has today developed into a sophisticated legal system, which can boast of a judiciary which is independent and has been the true custodians of the constitution. My dear students, before I leave India, I would recommend that you make a note of these cases that I will give you now, because they are a must read. Firstly, the landmark case of Keshavananda Bharati. Keshavananda Bharati. The second case is Golaknath. The third case is the Advocates on Record. And I would recommend that you read the cases, the judgments abolishing triple talaq. They abolished as being unconstitutional triple talaq of known to Muslim law for the purposes of divorcing, their, their dissolving their marriages. The judgment in the right of privacy by the Supreme Court of India, the abolition of the law against homosexuality, and the judgment in the Ayodhya Mosque case, to name a few, to demonstrate the robust nature of the Indian judiciary. My dear students, uh, you will see when you read all those cases, the whole argument of the basic structure of the constitution and so on and so forth, and the accommodation of scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and the accommodation of the principle of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, reverse discrimination or affirmative action uh, in the constitutional process. There is a lot to learn 
in that process because you will see in that constitution the decolonize the as far as possible there will long way to go even in the indian experience the decolonization of those colonial structures and colonial colonial principles and today india hardly perhaps the indian jurisprudence has been developed so much is so rich that today they don't have to look sometimes beyond passport control uh we let's leave let's leave india for a moment and move slightly farther east uh, and look at very briefly singapore my students singapore was established by sir thomas stamford raffles uh, for the east india company as a trading port in 1819 Uh, Raffles left his stamp well and truly in uh, Singapore. Uh, every time you turn around in Singapore, perhaps you will find something, either it's a Raffles hotel or a Raffles uh, Singapore or a mall or something or another dedicated to Raffles. Of course, Raffles did something great for Singapore because it is he he started it as a trading port in 1819, right? In 1826, it became a British Crown colony, and together with uh, Penang and Malacca uh, of uh, Malaysian uh, connections was generally referred to. The word that was used is the Straits Settlement of Great Britain. Straits, S T R A I T S. It was called the Straits Settlement of Great Britain, right? And that was uh, Singapore, Penang. Malacca, Malaysia, that whole lot, and that's why we still talk of uh, the Straits of Malacca. Uh, if, if, if you have been to Malacca, you, it's an interesting little town. It has a lot of history, and outside Malacca are the Straits of Malacca, where all the shipping lanes actually go even as of today, right? <laughs> Now, of of legal significance, right? Uh, of legal significance is the issuance of what was known as Letters patent, letters patent, P A T E N T, like patents. Letters patent. Now, letters patent, or it was commonly referred to as the Second Charter of Justice. The letters patent. These are old English terminology. It is simply what was the commonly referred to as the Second Charter of Justice on the twenty seventh of November, eighteen twenty six, by the British Crown of that year. Now, as of the date of the charter. right all english law what did the charter do the charter declared or decreed that all english law right as at the date of the charter essentially the common law and that is what the common law judgment law equity fairness what again judgment law and statutory law legislative law became part of the laws of singapore will you believe it by a charter right by an english charter the british the commonly known as the second charter of justice or the letters patent right all those laws called the common law the laws of equity and statutory law became laws of singapore the so therefore the inherent flexibility of the common law system right i must say allowed a fair degree of adaptation to local circumstances although the highest appellate court in singapore at that time right was the privy council in london until 1994 when singapore became a republic understood right so brought with it the english actually by introducing the uh, the charter of justice in 1826 that we brought to singapore allowed a, a fair degree of adaptation because the common law was very flexible to and it allowed flexibility in the application of law to local circumstances right although and although the final appeal was not to a singapore court but to the privy council in london until 1994 when singapore as i said became a republic exactly like us until 1972 consequent to uh, uh, the our independence in 1972 we our the appeal the, the last appeal the highest appellate court for sri lanka was the uh, privy council of the house of, of the house of lords in england 
So it was during this period that immigrants from China, India, Sri Lanka and surrounding countries were drawn to Singapore, essentially for commerce. Quite frankly, most of Singapore's leaders are from these countries, China, India, and Sri Lanka. It's a mixed race and there are a lot of Sri Lankan Tamils who are actually holding very high positions in, uh, in, 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 the, in the governance structure of Singapore. Right? So they were all actually attracted by the open kind of the, the policy on commerce. They were very open to doing commerce. And that was the beginning to a great future for Singapore. Now, after the Second World War, Singapore was granted self-governance within the British Commonwealth, right? Singapore was, was, was allowed self-governance within, within the British Commonwealth until it gained independence from British rule in 1963 by joining with the Federation of Malaya, Sarawak, and Sabah to form Malaysia, right? This little place called Singapore, after the Second World War, was granted autonomy, self-governance, but remained within the British Commonwealth until it was given independence from British rule in 1963, right? When they formed the Federation of Malaya, Sarawak and Sabah, Sarawak and Sabah are three other three regions, three islands, to form what we knew then as Malaysia. So Singapore was annexed to as a little part of Malaysia. Now, if you look at the Malaysian Peninsula, you will see Singapore, Sarawak, Sabah, and Singapore right at the little tip of 25 square miles. Right? Now, two, that was in 1963. Two years later, right, on August 9, 1965, Singapore separated from Malaysia to, became, to become an independent nation. So all the magic of Singapore was unfolded or unraveled within the last perhaps 45, under 50 years of that independence. So there you are, my dear, the, 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 my dear students. The manner in which English law was applied in Singapore may perhaps be described as essentially uh, what was known as gap filling, filling the gaps. Singapore law was actually used, English law was used to fill the gaps in indigenous Singapore or Malayan law, right? And was in certain circumstances, perhaps complex, particularly in the reception of English commercial law, which they actually preserve even to date. However, the application of English law by Singaporean courts ensured sufficient certainty and stability necessary for nation building. Now, they quickly realized the, that English law was useful to attract others from outside from the Western world. And they knew that our laws, the indigenous laws, were customary, uncertain, inflexible, very difficult, was a hodgepodge of laws, a mixture of laws which never really told us what exactly what the law was. They were quick to recognize that English law would be useful, right, uh, to bring certainty and stability necessary to build Singapore as a nation. So within the broad framework of English law applied by the Singaporean courts, in other words, they looked at the holistic nature of English law, right? And the Singaporean courts applied that, that, that wide approach uh, of adopting, adopting English law to the Singaporean courts. However, the, uh, uh, that actually became the, the Singapore, the, the, the law, the English law that the Singaporean courts applied by certain modifications and changes became the categories of law of non-English origin. So what did the Singaporeans do? They were clever. They used, took those laws and said, well, these laws we will use, these English principles we will actually use with modification. And those that they modified 
became the categories of laws of non english origin so there were laws of english origin and there were laws of non english origin the penal code and the evidence act right like the same as ours were derived from indian law right exactly what we did our penal code and our and our evidence act is a reprint of the indian penal code and the evidence act except for one section what is 296 here is 297 in india okay so the penal code and the evidence act were derived from indian law even in singapore so we have a lot of similarity within the singaporean laws and uh, sri lankan laws and indian laws right so there we are the while that was the case the singapore companies act draws exclusively you can make a note of this from australian legislation in fact we too copied australian legislation when we drafted the new companies act of 1972 right so i 19 1997 sorry right the you will see the new companies law actually the finds its origin in australian law so the singapore companies act draws extensively from australian legislation in addition strict laws directed at drug offenses corruption and chinese secret societies right there were lots of chinese secret societies over criminal gangs are in essence local laws addressing problems that were local to singapore so in other words when it came to drug offenses when it came to corruption and when it came to chinese secret societies singapore decided to deal with it in the style that they wanted to deal with it and they made their own laws right addressing problems that were local to singapore although i must say they were very harsh but that's what they decided to do now that's character isn't it i'm not saying that they are perfectly right but that's a way of doing it that that was the nation building process because you could not have drug drug dealers you could not have corrupt officials neither could you have secret societies that were that debilitated or perhaps was a negative influence on the nation building process food for thought isn't it right there you are so my dear students singapore's legal system is ostensibly recognized for its integrity right it is the people talk of singapore's legal system as being something out of this world right may not be exactly right but that's why i i, I deliberately use the words ostensibly recognized for its integrity and efficiency right certainly from the point of view of conducting business right i can assure you that i have i've done cases in singapore i dealt with the lawyers in singapore done many arbitrations and i know there is great efficiency that they have built into those systems no doubt it is a legal system which is rules based which has enabled good governance mark these words that i'm using a legal system which is rules based which has enabled good governance right which has led to the integrity and efficiency by which singapore conducts business is that a formula that sounds attractive perhaps it is it is today to that extent known as the world's best in ip protection they say that singapore laws are the world's best in the intellectual property protection it is said to be the least corrupt there is some corruption but the least corrupt it is said to be the best in arbitration although perhaps the most expensive to invoke and i can say that with first hand experience and it is said to be the best in doing business what is this magic formula my dear students singapore's laws come from a variety of sources it is like many established constitutions guarantees the fundamental rights of its citizens i leave that question to be answered you look at it carefully but it actually does but the perception the public perception is that it has established a constitution that guarantees the fundamental rights of its citizens or what 
Singapore perceives to be fundamental rights. I can tell you what Singapore perceives as fundamental rights is not exactly synonymous with what the Western world or perhaps what we in Sri Lanka perceive as fundamental rights. But who are we to judge? What is best for Singapore? There you are. So the constitution of Singapore sets out the basic framework for the government with its three branches, exactly like ours, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Now, as part of the implementation of laws, the executive is responsible for setting out detailed regulations. And regulations, you know, are subsidiary laws that have the source in the laws written by the legislature, with a view to ensuring that the legislature's laws achieve its objectives. So because of Singapore's history as a British colony, English common law is an important part of the Singapore legal system. Why? For precedent. You will appreciate that in a common law system such as Singapore, India, and ourselves, Sri Lanka, judicial precedent or what we describe as the decisions from a higher court in previous judgments on the same issue must be followed by the court when deciding a case. In other words, the application of the doctrine of stare decisis, S-T-R-E-E, -E, S-T-A-R-E, right? Stare, S-T-A-R-E, decisis, D-E-C-I-S-I-S. -I -I so Singapore's laws on contract, tort, and restitution have been created following this common law tradition of following the doctrine, of applying the doctrine of stare decisis. Now at the beginning, let me tell you that Singapore followed English judicial precedent, as I told you. But as time went on, Singapore moved to free itself from English law, developing a unique Singaporean jurisprudence, drawing in a global best practices in the law. Can we do something similar here? is something that we must seriously think about. It has a two-tier judicial system. How two-tier? With the state courts, which hear lower value cases, directly from people and resolve disputes. The second tier is the Supreme Court, which is made up of the High Court, and the Court of Appeal, which is the highest court of the land. In addition to the district and magistrate system, there are specialized courts which support district and magistrate systems with specialized courts which support business activity, such as copyright tribunals, the labor courts, family courts, traffic courts, uh, a Saria court, which is the court that rules on marriage disputes between those married under Islamic law, because Singapore has a large Malay population. A coroner's court, and a community court. There is also small claim courts, tribunals, which, are, which, is, which is an alternate, alternative for settling legal disputes under the threshold of 10,000 Singapore dollars in restitution and 20,000 Singapore dollars in damages, right? It is like our a conciliation boards or perhaps the mediation boards and the panchayats or the local dalits in India. The Supreme Court hears both civil and criminal matters. So while my dear students, Singapore's judicial system is effective, it has complemented its courts with alternate dispute resolution mechanisms such as mediation and arbitration, which is dealt with at the Singapore Mediation Center, which is non-profit making, in, uh, which is a non-profit making institution in which disputes are settled within a day. Mediation is done within a day. Can you dream of it here? Should we do that kind of thing here? Is there something that we need to follow? And the Singapore International Arbitration Center, in which I have done many, many arbitrations, the decisions of which are enforceable in 120 countries of the world under the New York Convention, and, uh, which is applicable to arbitrations. It is said, in contrast to many countries in Asia and perhaps around the world, where a Byzantine and corrupt legal system stifles business, 
with hyper regulation right with hyper regulation you will see that the more the regulation is the greater the, the tendency for corruption right the singapore legal system encourages quick and efficient dispute resolution having heard me give you a glimpse of the asian framework let me asian framework other than sri lanka let me endeavor to examine the legal system of our own country sri lanka and the lessons from our post colonial experience my dear students we are familiar with our legal system we know that from the arrival of the european powers at the end of the indigenous rule in sri lanka we carved out the future of a unique they carved out perhaps the future of a unique identity for the country for almost 500 years we were ruled by different foreign rulers as you know who had a different style of governing the country the european presence was marked by the portuguese rule from 1605 to 1658 the dutch rule from 58 to 1796 from 1658 to 1796 and finally the british from 1796 to 1948 so it is a matter of historical record that before the europeans arrived on our soil in 1505 we had the kingdoms of kote the kandian kingdom and the kingdom of jaffna in the north now interestingly the portuguese did not introduce their laws in the coastal regions they controlled right the portuguese didn't they had great fun they were fun loving the signal contribution they made was the introduction of the christian faith the portuguese were eventually ousted by the dutch the dutch took more control of the country virtually over the entire coastline and it is under them that the judicial system underwent an evolution which resulted in the roman dutch law gaining roots in the country and became even today the foundation of sri lanka's common law my dear students the dutch also made effort to codify customary law as they did in india of the different ethnic groups now the last of the foreign lord rulers were the british as we all know who had a strategic interest in the island even today <laughs> the europeans and the us are having all kinds of strategic interest to this island particularly the port of trincomalee things haven't changed much haven't they particularly the port of trincomalee trincomalee as it was one way they could pursue perhaps a western hegemony in the indian ocean and now they want to extend it to the indo pacific ocean the british adopted a unitary administrative and judicial system for the whole country they planted one flag now you will appreciate that with the fall of the kandian kingdom with the help of our kandian chiefs the british took over the whole country right and the roman dutch law was extended to the territory of ceylon the british of course was careful they didn't upset the roman dutch law that prevailed they kept it going right because they knew that the locals were quite comfortable with it right an act of settlement like the straits settlement these are lovely little words an act of settlement with the kandian chiefs provided for a certain amount of freedom autonomy right uh, a certain amount of freedom and autonomy right now interesting things happened at this point in time with the fall of the kandian kingdom as i said with the help of the kandian chiefs I told you that the British took over the whole country, and the Roman Dutch was extended to the territory of Ceylon. An act of settlement, I told you, with the Kandian chiefs, provided for certainty amounting to autonomy. As we know, the British rule ended on the fourth of February, nineteen forty-eight, when Ceylon gained its independence. I will leave you to research the history of the Colebrook, Cameron, Donald Moore. and the solberry commissions to define the rule and to determine the development of the country we don't have time today to go into that but it's worth reading 
As you know, in July of 1944, Lord Salisbury was entrusted with the function to draft a new post-independence constitution, which was structured upon a bicameral legislature, where members of the House of Representatives were elected by a popular vote, and where members of the Senate, part and members of the Senate, partly who are members of the House and partly by who are nominees of the Governor General. The governor general was appointed by the British monarch. Now, as it turned out to be, my dear students, Sri Lanka was a multiracial, multilingual country where various customs and conventions were given life to and accommodated within the legal system. There were three principal customary and religious laws that were, as we know, established. We know it was the Candian law. There was Tesa Valami and Muslim law. The British Charter ensured, now what was interesting, the British, they, the British Charter that they established in 1801 ensured that laws that were in force at the time the British took over remained at that, remained at that time, remained as it was. They were clever. You know, as far as the personal laws were concerned, the principal customary and religious laws, they didn't touch it. And it remains even to date other than perhaps the Canadian law. Not to that effect. So the Roman Dutch law found its application in many other aspects of life as the common law of the country. So the Roman Dutch law and the personal laws were remain, they subsisted even during British time after the British Charter of 1801. Now, what was the result of that? The result of that was the common law was subject to many changes. Right? The common law became subject to many influences. One such example is the constitutional and administrative, the constitutional and administrative law of Sri Lanka, which was structured on the Anglo-American system Whereas commercial law was based on English commercial law. My dear students, we see that Roman Dutch law to be established in areas such as was established as coming from the Roman Dutch principle in laws such as in succession, in other words, inheritance, in the laws of dealing with persons, property, and obligations, and in the law that we described as the laws of delict, right? the English, the Western world calls it thought, but we call it delict. In other words, civil wrongs, civil, in other words, civil injuries, delicts, civil injuries. So there you are. So Roman Dutch law to be, was established in areas such as succession, persons, property and obligations. And obli sorry, the Roman Dutch law, can I say it again? The Roman Dutch law was established in areas such as succession, persons, and property, while obligations, and in the law that we dis was deal dealt with in the law of delicts, using Roman Dutch South African principles. My dear students, criminal law and its procedure were governed by the Penal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code, exactly like what the Indians did, using English law. In the application, therefore, of this complex combination of laws, uh, which we would call a hodgepodge, perhaps, of laws, the judges of that time, essentially, uh, who are essentially British, found it difficult to maintain consistency. Even the British found it difficult to maintain the consistency of their judicial uh, pronouncements. What was the result? As a result, British judges resorted to English law where there was ambiguity in the Roman Dutch law or where the Roman Dutch law was silent. So in other words, English law filled the gaps because British judges applied English law where there was ambiguity, right? Where there was uncertainty in Roman Dutch law or where the Roman Dutch law was silent, right? and where the Roman Dutch law left gaps, yawning gaps sometimes, right? 
where, where they had to look to naturally English law because they were English judges. And of course, we were a colony of England, right? So there you are. That was the accommodation. That was a synthesis, right? The beginning of a nice synthesis of laws of both English and Roman Dutch principles that were resorted to side by side. So the paucity or the lack of judicial precedent and the lack of codification uh, in the law gave the judges an opportunity to avoid the application of Roman Dutch principles. So where there was, where there was, a, there was ambiguity in the laws and there was uncertainty in the law, the judges immediately looked to English law that gave them much greater certainty. Now, the upshot of all this was that a body of English law and principles came to be established along with, right, along with English law, right? So the result was that a massive body of laws came to be established along with English law, right? Along with the Roman Dutch law, in addition to the personal laws that were back by that time in place. So there you are. That's what began, that's what, that's how we succeeded to parts of Roman Dutch law and parts of English law being applied, right? Now it may be of interest to note that our personal laws have attracted the attention of the United Nations treaty bodies. Now that's interesting, isn't it? The Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. The Human Rights Committee, HRC. The Committee on the Rights of the Child, CRC and the Committee on the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, CESCR, have made regular observations regarding the discrimination of women under the customary and religious law regimes, which they claim is an, was an impediment to the empowerment of women, in particular the possibility of marriage of girls as young as 12, and the adverse effects of personal laws uh, on uh, uh, on personal laws, on uh, uh, the economic and social rights of women. Now we have come a long way with amendments and I think uh, uh, the situation today is uh, far more acceptable to the international community than what it was. CEDA in particular was critical of the preference of men or women under the personal laws when it came to inheritance. Now that is the case perhaps in, perhaps in Thes Balami. And the lack of judicial review of pre-constitutional systems, right? Uh, you will see that uh, uh, there's a lack of judicial review in the constitutional pro process. In other words, not as much as India has allowed it or perhaps uh, England has. Of course, in England, there is no question of uh, judicial review of sovereign laws. But today, in the case of Rex versus Jackson, you might read it. Uh, the English courts have said that, uh, that they are willing to visit that, uh, that the question of absolute sovereignty, if the wrong methods are adopted uh, to perhaps pass laws uh, which will attract uh, that sovereign protection. Rex versus, uh, Regina versus Jackson is the case. Now, having recognized all this, you will appreciate that we have come a long way to recognizing all these rights on an equal footing today by guaranteeing to all citizens of every race or region or religion or sex, equal rights. And that today we have come a long way to give, providing a constitutional guarantee in the Republican Constitution of 1978, right? Which now actually cures all these old complaints. And today we rank equally in the question of equality, uh, in, in, on the question of equality, uh, perhaps with the best of jurisdictions uh, universally. Right. My dear students, you will therefore appreciate, you will appreciate, you probably know that the hierarchy of the Sri Lankan court system is set out in the Judicature Act number two of 1978 as amended, where it has established the court system. I don't need to trouble you too much. Uh, the courts of first instance, and of course the courts of review, the appellate courts and the Supreme Court, which is vested uh, the superior courts, which consists of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, which is vested with appellate jurisdiction. Now, it is common knowledge that 
until 1992, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in Britain was the final court of appeal uh, to Ceylon, as it was known then. Uh, this right of appeal was abolished with the promulgation, as I told you, of the 1972 autochthonous constitution. Now, note that word I used, autochthonous. It is spelled A-U-T-O-C-H-T-H-O-N-O-U-S. What it simply means is homegrown, rooted in our own soil. The 1972 constitution, we said, was the product of a constituent assembly, right? Uh, which established the notion of national state assembly as the supreme instrument of state power. That was our first homegrown constitution. And the, and the word that we, the technical word that we use is constitutional autochthony, or we call it an autochthonous constitution. Now, let me very quickly run you through the structure of our courts, uh, which I don't think I need to tarry too much upon. Uh, because we all know what the structure of our courts is. Now, as I told you, uh, the, uh, at that time, uh, parliamentary uh, constitutions, uh, co parliamentarians, actually members of parliament, constitute themselves as members of what was termed as the Constituent Assembly uh, to draft and adopt a new constitution, which became effective on the, on the 22nd of May 1972, uh, the, the, our Prime Minister was the first woman Prime Minister of the world, Madam Sirimavu Bandaranayaka. There are also other courts uh, that we have established as the Kathi courts that handle matrimonial disputes like in India among Muslims and numerous tribunals uh, which we have this, which I don't intend to uh, no, which I don't intend to deal with. Now, as you know, the Supreme Court is the highest and final court of record and exercises final civil and criminal, final civil and criminal appellate jurisdiction. The Supreme Court, as you know, has jurisdiction in respect of bills and the interpretation of the constitution, uh, appellate matters, final appellate matters, fundamental rights, and the sole jurisdiction in relation to presidential election petitions, the validity of referendums, and the breach of privileges of parliament, and of consultative jurisdiction on matters referred to it by the Sri Lankan, by our president. Now, uh, litigants who do not agree with the decision of the original court, as we know, uh, can take their cases right up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and of course, you know uh, that the Supreme Court will only agree to considering a matter uh, before it, only if it involves a substantial question of law and it only can be moved with the leave of the Supreme Court first had and obtained. You know that the Supreme Court is composed of the Chief Justice and not less than six and not more than 10 judges. And very soon we are going to have an increase of the Supreme Court by six more judges. And the Court of Appeal will also see uh, an increase uh, uh, of uh, six more judges. Uh, that is uh, by the constitutional amendment of the, the 20th Amendment. Now, cases that fall under the several jurisdictions of the court are exercised subject to the provisions of the Constitution by a bench of at least three judges of the Supreme Court. Therefore, the different cases may be heard at the same time by several judges of the Supreme Court. Now, the Constitution, as you know, uh, provides for a Chief Justice with the authority to increase the number of Supreme Court judges hearing a particular case uh, to five or more judges. Uh, this increase in the number of judges, as you know, of hearing a Supreme Court case would transpire, especially if the issue under consideration is one of general and perhaps of public importance. Now, appeals of decisions of a high court trial at bar, and that is where three judges uh, hear a high court matter, uh, is heard by a bench of five or more Supreme Court judges. Now, the Supreme Court, you will note, is also entrusted with certain exclusive jurisdictions subject to provisions of the Constitution. It also uh, exercises jurisdiction over constitutional matters, as I said, and fundamental rights. Remember, my dear students, 
that the sole and exclusive jurisdiction to hear and determine issues pertaining to fundamental rights uh, uh, is limited to executive and administrative action. Now, what does that mean? What it means that you can only complain of an infringement of a fundamental right with regard to matters um, arising out of the actions of an instrumentality of the state. Now, I'm using a very wide word, an instrumentality of the church, of the state. I'm not from, so we have moved from very narrow executive and administrative action to today to catch up what are known as instrumentalities of the state. For example, the stock exchange, the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, in other words, where executive and administrative activity is now extended to other organs of that has connections with the state. Today, remember, there is also what is known as a horizontal expansion of this jurisdiction. It was all these days a vertical expansion, but today the Supreme Court jurisdiction, both in India and in Sri Lanka, and perhaps globally, there is a horizontal expansion of, the, of what is known as uh, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in relation to violations of fundamental rights. In other words, states can no longer divest itself of uh, public duties by divesting itself to a private individual, right? The, the, now, even that kind of activity can be brought, that is a horizontal extend, ex expansion of government activity. So where there is a horizontal expansion of executive and administrative and state activity to even other mechanisms which may not necessarily be government may be, may be brought under the microscope of fundamental rights. Think of that. Now, if you remember the Reji Ranasunga case, the Reji Ranasunga case is one case in which uh, uh, the minister was actually brought in in that particular case. Uh, he had, of course, he ne never, he was not directly responsible. It was a case that was filed against the police, but he was added as a respondent because they, they claimed that the source of that whole activity was the minister. So again, there we are, a horizontal expansion of that jurisdiction. So these fundamental rights include the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, freedom from torture, uh, right to equality, freedom from arbitrary arrest, detention and punishment, prohibition of retro penal legislation, freedom of speech, assembly and association. Now most of these, as you will see, is part of the uh, peremptory norms that cannot be, I can tell you, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of religion, freedom, freedom from torture, right? Freedom from equality, arbitrary arrest, detention and punishment are all perhaps peremptory norms. They are part of the jus cogens, C-O-G-E-N-S, the jus cogens, read about it. Remember, my dear friends, or my dear students, the right to equal protection, the right to equality, perhaps is the cornerstone of fundamental rights. All other fundamental rights are structured upon it. Certainly these peremptory norms must be guarded, carefully cherished and guarded uh, it is only upon them that we can structure the rule of law meaningfully so that we, all of us, can live uh, in peace and dignity in this country of ours, right? So they are very, very important things to give your mind to. So the Constitution provides, remember, uh, for temporary restrictions on fundamental rights in the event of national security. For example, if you take the COVID-19. Now, today we are locked down. Why I have to talk to you is because we have our liberty has been restricted for the public good. So there you are. That's a classic example of where public security, public fundamental rights are restricted for reasons of national security. And as I said in a recent lecture at the KDU, national security covers, perhaps captures almost every governmental activity that finally it health education, transportation, peace, unity, the rule of law, all these go to finally assure for us what is known as national security, right? National security is not something that stands in isolation, that stands in alone. It cannot stand 
alone. It cannot stand alone, right? Look at what's happening in Belarus. Look at what's happening in Spain. Look at what's happening in Thailand, right? Where if national security and military activity alone, right, is going to, st is going to control, is going to assure national security, the answer is no. And that is why you at the KDUA, KDU, is being, is being molded in an environment to understand, right, to be able to comprehend that national security is something much more, right, than, in other words, the soft methods in, of assuring the rule of law. Uh, we have to adopt the soft methods of ensuring national security and before we resort to those very uh, extreme methods of it. Uh, which can only perhaps be put in place where there are extreme measures. So the Supreme Court also exercised exercises consultative jurisdiction. If the President of the Republic deems that a question of law or fact that a reason is, a, is, is of such a nature and of such public importance, the President may refer questions directly to the Supreme Court for an opinion. The consultative jurisdiction also extends to any concerns expressed by any member of parliament regarding the ability of the president to effectively discharge his or her duties. Now these concerns in the first instance would be addressed in writing to the speaker who will probably refer the matter to the Supreme Court. Now I think I would leave uh, you uh, due to the constraints of time. I will leave you to read more about the Supreme Court because you will have sufficient material to appraise yourself of how the Supreme Court works. Uh, so legal issues, for example, surrounding any breaches of privilege of parliament by any person also falls under the purview of the Supreme Court. So my dear students, a noteworthy feature of the Sri Lankan legal system without its constitutional development was the shift from the 1946-47 independence constitution to the 1972 first autochthonous republican constitution and the second 1978 constitution where Sri Lanka moved from an executive prime minister to an executive presidency in a semi-presidential or what we call a hybrid style of government which is described in constitutional law as one of premier presidentialism. You can read about it right more akin to the french system or perhaps very close or very similar to the argentinian style of government within a parliamentary democracy so there we are i have done the aftermath of the 25 years of the internecine conflict was indeed a setback to the progress of the nation however remember that we were able to pick up the threads notwithstanding a relentless, relentless pressure from international bodies under the guise of accountability, working through their co cohorts, the NGOs who were funded by these international organizations. None of the constitutions referred to a while ago, unfortunately, had any specific provision setting out the relationship between domestic and international law. We have, this is something that we need to give our mind to in the drafting of our new constitutions, if it is ever going to be one. It must be noted, however, that with the dawn of independence uh, came, English, uh, came English public law that gave Sri Lanka the power of judicial review or administrative action. It might be well to remember the famous Kodeswaran case in which the petitioner of public servant was able to successfully challenge the language policy of the then governor. Sri Lanka, however, was able to make rapid changes as a result of globalization, it must be, however, accepted. There is a definite acceptance by the judiciary and the political system that the post-colonial legal system was and is dualist in nature. No, you can note the word I'm using, D-U-A-L-I-S-T, dualist in nature, in contrast to being what is known as monist, M-O-N-I-S-T. It was perhaps this distinction that led to the continuous suspicion regarding our posture on the application of the international law in the context of our parliamentary sovereignty. And in the Singha Rasa case, 
Singharasa. His Lordship, the Chief Justice, went on to make the pronouncement that international law does not automatically apply to Sri Lanka, but must be adopted into our law by a local statute due to its dualist nature. Now, for example, the, the Geneva Convention, although we are signatories to it, we have a Geneva Convention Act here. The ICCPR, we have an ICCPR local law here. And that's because we have done that to in recognition of our dualist nature of our legal system. Our perception of international law can be well understood on a close examination of the judgments. And I will recommend that you read this judgment, Lee Lawati versus the Minister of External Affairs, which I would perhaps critique as being old law. Then we have the Sepala Ekanayaka case, which ratified the Tokyo, Hague and Montreal conventions on matters pertaining to offenses against the aircraft. And of course, the Singharasa case, which I referred to in which the court recognized the dualist nature of the jurisdiction and its inability to automatically apply international law, notwithstanding the Sri Lankan government having ratified the international covenant, as I said, on civil and political rights. It is therefore my respectful and considered view that these are areas which require to be revisited in regard to contemporary jurisprudential developments uh, globally today. So my dear students, it is my view uh, uh, that another important area in which the legal system could make significant strides is the area of human rights to which many other countries in the region, other than the exception of India, uh, have made considerable advances. The Solberry Constitution of 48, you will note, entailed a minority, included a minority protection clause, and that was Article 29.2. Now, notwithstanding this article, minority Tamils, it is critiqued, we have been found faulty, that notwithstanding Article 29.2 in the Solberry Constitution, that minority Tamils plantation workers were disenfranchised with the Citizenship Act of 1949, or the Single Only Act of 1956. However, the Republican Constitution of 72 had its own weaknesses, for it created the climate for arbitrary use of state power by a declaration of emergency, a prohibition of judicial review, and a suspension of the Bill of Rights protecting individuals. But this was put right to a great extent by our 1978 Constitution, which uh, in Article 12 recognized the rights of all as being equal. So there you are, uh, the current Republican constitution that I said before was a paradigm shift of the political structure, which again limited fundamental rights uh, for reasons of national security, public order, public health and morality, or the rights and freedoms of others, or of meeting the just requirements of the welfare of a democratic society as we applied in this pandemic situation. It is noteworthy, however, that we continue to abide by the principle of stare decisis. My dear students, I could perhaps continue this lecture for the whole day, save for the fact that I have left you with enough, perhaps enough material to embark on a journey that will take you through uh, the constitutional development of our legal system in the context of the Asian experience. You will observe that we have yet a long and difficult way to travel. Perhaps with the advent of COVID-19, we will be sent sensitized to the realization that we need to ensure that every citizen, irrespective of what or who he is or she is, is entitled to respect and the equal protection of the law so that we in the region would live in peace and in dignity. That brings my lecture to an end. I will be happy to answer any questions that you would want to ask me if I certainly can provide you with those answers. Thank you very much for giving me a patient hearing. Yes, uh, can I uh, take any questions if there's anything that anyone wants to ask me? Sir? Yes. Uh, sir, we also have in our constitution uh, that you said is homegrown. 
uh, unification policies or reforms in place to attain um, unity in diversity or certainty in law, like you said, um, is that well, the Indian? Well, yeah, yes, to an extent. If you look at the fundamental rights clauses, for example, if you look at the directive principles of state policy, right? Uh, if you look at that chapter dealing with the directive principles and the fundamental rights structure, right? You will see that that lends itself to uh, only one type of treatment. That is equality, structured on the pillar, on the cornerstone of equal protection of the law and of equality. And the guarantee to the peremptory norms of uh, guarantees against torture, or inequality, and so on and so forth. In other words, the whole flavor of the fundamental rights jurisdiction is a one of unification and equal rights, right? In other words, to look at the human family as one, right? So I think that's, of course, many other countries have done it in different ways, uh, or with uh, recognizing uh, different ways, but this is one way of doing it. So in other words, we need to kind of uh, start uh, developing maturity in the interpretation of these laws. It's not good enough to have it in a constitution, as I said. Constitutionalism would demand that we actually give life to these provisions. You know, it's not good enough for me to do the lecture and for you to probably become great academics. We need to give life to the law. And if we don't give life to the law in our day-to-day -day things, in our day-to-day -day things, this would be a dead letter. So there you are. I hope that answers your question. Right? Thank you. Anyone else who wants to, to, please feel free to ask anything you want. I'll try and answer it as best as I could. Or if you like to post your questions to your supervisor or your lecturers uh, and who can actually in turn uh, send it across to me and I'll be happy to probably provide you with some of these answers, maybe at a, a little discussion session where we can just openly discuss some of these issues. <clears throat> Why don't we, if there's anything, let, let's talk about it. I, I've said a lot of things to you. Let's talk about it openly, just freely let your ideas flow. We, we, we must learn to uh, agree, we must learn to disagree. That's the great thing about what we are learning. That's the style of learning. And that's the maturity we must be able to achieve. So this discussion is not one way. I have left you with material to start uh, perhaps uh, making you curious about these things and start, tell me, no, no, I don't agree with uh, Chief Justice Pires. No, no, I don't. Uh, that's fine. Because that's only, the, it's only then that I will know there is someone who disagrees with me. Someone who agrees with me. So let me encourage you to ask uh, these questions and don't worry about whether the question is a good question or a bad question. I have also asked many questions during my time when I, lived there, when I went through the phase that you are as a student. So don't feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, sir, you mentioned in the lecture that there are similarities in laws with Singapore, India and Australia. Yeah. Uh, like Singapore has applied the English law in a way that it would support their national building. So mm. my question is, uh, in Sri Lanka, have we applied the English law in a way that it's like modified in a way that it suits our system or have we applied it as it is? No, we have. Actually, we have uh, in a number of areas applied. Now, if you take administrative law, right? Let's take the example of administrative law, which is a classic example, of course. Administrative law in Sri Lanka is essentially governed by English law, right? And if you look at any application filed in the Court of Appeal for a writ application, now this is something you can learn right away. Look at the caption of the writ application, right on top. In the mat, and this is how the caption will read. And if anybody who writes a caption in any other way is writing a wrong caption, I can tell you that. Right? And this is how the caption reads. In the matter of an application, you can take it down. In the matter of an application, in the nature, in the nature of a writ of, in the nature of a writ of certiorari, in the nature of a writ of mandamus, in the nature of a writ of prohibition, in the nature of a writ of procedendi, 
Now, what I'm interested in, I want you to appreciate the words I'm using. In the matter, this is the caption, huh? the caption to the application. In the matter of an in the matter of an application, in the matter of an application, in the nature of right? Eki swabhave. Ye mukhat api ekiyanni. Eki swabhave ki rukin kiyanni. Api the heme katne. E vage dya kiye ne kai. Ne? You understand? Right? In the nature, even in the nature of right? Eka ne engalante. Rit Adikarna Balasi Mava Veni Adikarna Balasi Mavaka Galas Balasi Mavak Atulata Karna Lima Kenega make here. In the nature within, right now, now there you are. You see the adoption of English law. Then I can tell you we have today refined our jurisdiction. We have applied it using English principles. We have applied it in our, in our local areas very effectively. That's one. If you will look at the rules of equity. The rules of equity have been very effectively used at in industrial law, industrial disputes. What is the jurisdiction in industrial disputes? Justice and equity. If justice and equity demands that the termination of the particular worker is justified, that's the end of the matter. Look at the Supreme Court. The fundamental rights jurisdiction is based on justice and equity. Nothing else, right? So there you are. So we have in used English principles, the, the, the rough, the tough application of the English principles. We have used, we have modified them in many respects to suit our own conditions. Even for example, we take our criminal law, the offenses against women and children. Today by the amendments, we have made great strides in the protection of women and children. In the area of family law, I must say we haven't made too much of progress, right? And that is because we are still actually holding on to, you know, we, we are not applying it and giving it life the way we ought to, right? So there you are. The, uh, we have actually nourished our law uh, in, a, in a large measure uh, by uh, using, uh, introducing local, in other words, uh, localizing our laws, localizing English laws, to meet local conditions, but applying, for example, the same principles. So we haven't, in other words, it's a modification. The application of the law has remained uh, as it is, but uh, uh, of course, as much as possible, we try and, uh, we, I always encourage judges to try and uh, mitigate the harshness of English laws uh, in keep, to meet our own conditions. Okay? Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Yeah, anybody else who wants to ask a question? Sir, I have questions. Sure, please. Um, sir, I think when considering the other Asian countries in Sri Lanka, almost Sri Lanka has the kind of same laws. Like yes. when we compete about the like 1978 constitution, and yes. those days, I think we had the most perfect constitution when comparing with other countries but today what we see what i see is the uh, lack of implementation of these laws so hmm. when comparing to other strengthened in the implementation i mean yeah I, I we have the laws but exactly. it, we are not implementing them so yeah. other countries they are implementing them and they are like in the right path we have yeah. the laws what can I'm we do to implement? Very good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you are able to appreciate that. So making that change is in your hands. You are the, going to be the future lawmakers. That change must come from you. So now, now I, I'm holding you. I'm going to hold you and your friends to a promise. If you appreciate what you said, told me just now, right? Remember that 10 years from today, if I was to meet you, I'm going to hold you to that promise and say, what have you done about that? So there you are. You are right. We have all these beautiful laws. But what's going wrong? Why isn't it working? As you quite rightly said, the implementation process, the compliance process is poor. So I'm telling you that it is up to you, the younger generation of our country, to put that right. Right? So work towards that. Study your law hard, 
understand study not hard study smartly we don't i don't ask students today to study don't study hard study smart right be a smart student learn it properly and start making these changes so that we can be in the rung of the top notch countries in the world where we can have a legal system which is as good as any other country okay right very good question thank you sir any other question any other question or is it that we okay if we have run out of questions uh then should we bring the whole uh, the the, uh, the lecture to a, to an end and uh, uh, if there is anything that i can uh, probably sometime in the future we can probably have a discussion on it on one particular topic i hope you enjoyed today's lecture it was rather long uh, but it was an overview a birds eye view of what the legal systems of asia was and in the lessons that we can actually learn Uh, and the lessons uh, in the in the context of our own constitutional process right uh, as i said there's a lot to, to lot to do and as uh, this uh, you know, the student the last question the last observation made we appear to have everything in place but just that what we need is the implementation giving life to the law the implementation of the law efficiently so to do that we need efficient implementers people who will make it work and the people who make it work are not only the public the public must certainly respect the law and give life to the law but those who are in positions of privilege and power must know to give must to implement these laws and and you and students such as you and teachers such as myself must learn to uh, must learn the tradition of perhaps giving life to the law and giving every opportunity for the law to work in the way that it was that parliament intended it to work right laws must not be used to oppress people to make life difficult remember my dear students laws must facilitate life we don't live for laws laws are meant to help us to get on with life in a systematic orderly manner we mustn't be looking at laws as being something you know which is meant to be obeyed no not at all we must draw on the strength of the law to be able to take a lift our country to the levels of uh, perhaps the levels of uh, development that uh, we would that this country uh, would like that our people of this country would like to see right okay thank you sir uh, thank you very much sir i am uh, dr hemant course coordinator yes, sir yes. Uh, one of our actually student is uh, ready to deliver the vote of thanks please thank you. wait for a while okay sure 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 dear sir uh, on behalf of the staff and students of general sir john kotalal defense university and the eurasia foundation i wish to express our gratitude to you for being here with us and sharing your valuable knowledge amid your very busy schedule we are truly honored and humbled we are all inspired by your thoughts provoking words of knowledge thank you sir and uh, also we would also like to extend our special vote of thanks to the dean faculty of law mr mangala vijay singh for coordinating the lecture for us today thank you very much sir thank you very much for those kind words and i wish you all the luck in the world and i hope you will enjoy the law and you will be great students of the law and that the law will be enriched by your contribution in the days to come thank you very much thanks a lot right i'm going to end the session now yes okay, and i'm leaving sir. the session with my best wishes okay. to all of you huh? thank you very much sir thank okay, you okay goodbye you, all the goodbye, best sir. bye